everybody, but <laughs> oh my. Well, I'm I'm ad living all this, so I don't <laughs> I don't have a script. But anyway, like I said, it worked for me. It was a good deal. I got to see a lot of the world. I got to go to places people wouldn't even think of vacationing in. And I got to see a lot of wildlife. I met some great people. Um, one that stands out, uh, Dr. George Archibald. You all know him from the International Crane Foundation. He's become a very good friend of mine over the years. And he's opened so many doors for me for photography and travel. Uh, he's just a phenomenal individual. But um, so thank Tyler, my background. A, a touch more on my background. This project didn't start out as, oh, I want to write a book on the National Monuments of America. No, courtesy of some of my work with the military, I've got PTSD, anxiety, depression, and then da, 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 da. so this started out by myself, for myself, as something that would give me focus and a purpose after I retired in 09. Um, it had been several very difficult years post-retirement. And this book was, I, I won't say it's a lifesaver, but it, it really made a difference. And if you know anybody out there, if anybody online is a veteran or somebody suffering from any of those afflictions, um, consider that. You know, it doesn't have to be for any end purpose, but to give yourself um, a purpose and a focus in life can make a huge difference. So, and again, heads up for all the vets out there. Um, anybody know where this is? Coyote Buttes in the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument that overlaps the border between Air, Northern Arizona and Southern Utah. Need a permit to get in there, which is a good thing because it limits the number of people. And so, the actual wave was what you, this is called is a very small couple of acres at most. So if it was just come on back when you feel like it, you'd have people running all over the place and it would just ruin the experience. So permitting systems can be good. So this is my partner and my service dog throughout this whole effort. He passed in June. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's been great. He was great. Just a phenomenal fellow, incredibly smart, very capable. That's the top of Torrey's Peak. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's one of the 14ers here. And this is before we skied down the Northwest Couar together. Yeah. And he's up there. He's always proud of himself. And I, I swear to God, he knew exactly when I was going to take a picture because he'd kind of stick his head out there. <laughs> he'd be like, here I am. Get me in the picture. He just loved it. Just a great fellow. So again, Tyler went over this. Um, no need to review it again. It's a great tool for the, a sitting president to protect lands that are, people get the sense, and you'll hear this in, when people oppose the establishment of a national monument, they'll say, well, that's a land grab. Well, no, these are already existing federal lands. In a few instances, they were state lands that were then transferred to the federal government and then became a monument. But 99% of the time, they were already federal lands. And I'm a huge proponent of preserving as much land as possible for the very reason that they're not making any more. We're losing it, tens of thousands of acres every day, the development and whatever else. But yeah, the more public land there is out there, the more you and I can get out there and enjoy it and take advantage of it. And if it's preserved under something like the, the Antiquities Act, all the better. Who are the two presidents that didn't establish a national monument during their term? Think hard, think to the right. <laughs> Nixon and Trump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is incredibly unfortunate because it's, it benefits everybody. It, it truly does, it benefits everybody. Uh, President Biden just enacted the Camp Hale National Monument. He just passed, and he, that's an executive order. It can be undone, like they tried to do with Bears Ears and uh, 
Escalante, which is being reversed now. They've been challenged over the years, over the decades, and none of it's really held up in court. Once the president puts his scribble on there, it's good to go for the most part. This here, many of these national monuments are what they call dark sky parks. They're remote, many of them are huge, pushing a million acres or more. Light pollution is essentially non-existent out there. To be able to see the night sky, the Milky Way, and that bright blob up there in the upper right is Jupiter. These are perfect places to go for that, even if you don't do the photography. A couple of weeks ago, we were at Craters of the Moon up in Southern Idaho, and I brought my little spotting scope out. Jupiter was rising in the east, and we put it on, the, on, on Jupiter, and you could see four bright spots that indicated four, I don't know how many moons they have. I don't know anything about photography, you know, the, the universe out there, but you could see four bright spots around Jupiter. And it's like, hey, those are moons. And it's like, that's so cool. So we'll start, there's no real easy way to go up, over and down and, and see all the monuments. It's more of a zigzag backtracking route. So there's no real order to this. This is outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico, the organ pipes. And that's exactly kind of what it looks like, like an organ, I guess, that's what they were thinking. Lots of opportunity there. I'm gonna go kind of fast. In the book, which will be for sale after the presentation, there's 76 monuments. And I've only chosen maybe 20 or so to show here. And the obvious highlight is, are there birds there? So we'll kind of clip right through it. If you have a question, feel free to throw your hand up and stop me and we'll address it and then move on, okay? Lots of camping here. There's a horse trail that goes down to El Paso, I don't know, 20, 30 miles, something like that. There's a campground on the other side, Aguiar Springs, on the way to uh, White Sands, which was a monument, but now it's a national park. When did that happen? Uh, a couple of years ago, yeah. Grand Canyon started out as a national monument and became a national park. We had six million visitors a year. So that's the quality of this, some of these areas, what it can be. What it... Rio Grande del Norte is up in Northern New Mexico, right at the New Mexico, Colorado border. Uh, what's that little town there? Antonito. Yeah, just south of that. Yeah, yeah. Huge place. You can get lost there. Three agencies manage most of the national monuments, the Park Service, Forest Service, and BLM. The Park Service, they have the most rules <laughs> out of all of them, and they're the strictest. They have the best brochures. They actually have brochures. They have maps and whatnot. And they'll often ask to see your uh, interagency pass. Are you familiar with that? That's a bargain. That's a bargain at twice the price. Or you get to pay a fee to enter national park lands. But um, BLM's pretty open. Uh, camping is dispersed. They just ask that you don't drive where there aren't already tracks. And generally, that's easy enough to do. My take on, on fires, don't start them in any of these places. They're incredibly remote. Everything for the last 10, 15 years is very, very dry. And fighting a fire in an area like this will be next to impossible. All they could do is control how it burns. So don't even, I just say, don't, don't even bother with an outdoor fire. Just forget it. Those are Southern Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And the Rio Grande itself cuts a chasm just before that peak there. So you can't drive all the way across the other side. You have to go all the way around. Some of the wildlife you can find in this monument. I'm predominantly a wildlife photographer and pretty much an opportunist. Whatever shows up, I'll shoot. <laughs> what I like to see in mammals are ears forward, not tucked back like they're uncomfortable. They're un they don't like your presence. You've disturbed them or distressed them somehow. And in birds and mammals alike, or even amphibians, lizards, you know. That little reflection in the eye, the white, that's called catch light. That's where the light reflects off of the retina 
of whatever creature it is you're photographing. As we look at pictures, just kind of keep in mind, where, do my eye, where does my eye go in that particular image? And see if you're drawn to that feature, if there's catch light in that animal or that bird's eye, and then file that away for your photography. Close one, this is a day trip right outside of town over to Fluorescent, great place to go. Lots of fossilized insects, which is kind of neat. You look at all these bugs they got inside there, it's pretty cool. And then there's several walks around there, an old homestead. Lots of wildlife, a red fox, a wild turkey. <laughs> oh no, that's okay, a bull oak. I was gonna say one thing about turkeys. I used to have a maroon Dodge truck, a big four by four, that blah, blah, blah. And I can't remember the name of the road, but it's over where I live, um, kind of near Mesa Drive in that area. Um, Johnson Reservoir in that area. There's a large flock of turkeys there and in April, that's their breeding season. So I, I often drive there looking for them to show up and I'll pull over and photograph them. And one of them, looked at me, he's probably 50, 100 meters away. And it was a maroon truck. And he absolutely did not like that. Came over, jumped the fence, crossed the road, got right below the door and he's gobbling all over the place, walking back and forth, saying, just acting like a fool. <laughs> and I did a short little video and I just had to laugh, but that's a turkey for you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, bull elk. This, He's got kind of an odd spike coming out of his forehead there. <laughs> but elk are very common throughout the Rocky Mountains, especially here in Colorado. <clears throat> Browns Canyon, this lies between Buena Vista to the north and Salida to the south. Not huge, but the Arkansas River here is the really big draw for water recreation, uh, rafting, kayaking. It's a world class fishery, so it's kind of got everything, good camping, some, some backpacking trails. That's Mount Princeton in the background. Yes, sir. Um, I've been hearing from other people that like, this is now a national park. I hadn't heard that. It's not to say that it isn't, but I just hadn't heard that. Yeah. And again, as I, as I mentioned before, it's easy. Congress has to give approval for a national park and given our dysfunctional Congress, it would almost surprise me in this day and age that they could actually get together and accomplish that. Be a good thing, certainly, but yeah, they all have to sit down and say, yeah, that's a good idea, and, and then decide who takes credit for it, which. Uh... Yeah, hmm. That might be what, what was going on, yeah, because wilderness gives it a higher level of protection than a monument. A monument, you can still do hunting, um, backpacking, hiking, whatnot, all these fishing, boating opportunities. Uh, they often do mineral, continue to do mineral extraction. So all those activities are still allowed. That's part of the compromise that they go through in the process of getting the monument established. And then maybe later down the road, they can fine tune that a little bit or make it into a national park. But the first objective is to get it established as a monument because that protects everything within those boundaries. So if you wanna take a commercial raft on the Arkansas River, this piece of it here, which is um, about halfway but over by Nathrop, halfway between Bernavis and Salida, this is called Seidel Suck. And the suck is when the water is going along like this and then it drops down over a rock or rock features and then it comes back up and it's kind of like a washing machine. And they're doing it right, they're skimming over the top. If you get caught in it, you get to do that over and over and, and it can be fatal, it can be very, very dangerous. But I watched one raft tip, tip over and everybody goes scattering, little heads bobbing down the river they picked everybody up, but it was kind of uh, a little concerning, but yeah, good fun. All right. There's a prairie falcon there. I'm not gonna tell you where I found it. This is the baby over there on the left. 
both adults were there at the nest. Um, even though I, I, I used to hunt a lot and doing photography of wildlife, you, you kind of take some of that skill set and apply it to photographing wildlife. And I consider myself to be pretty good at stalking and hiding and you know being quiet and just being patient. But they like that, they knew I was there. <laughs> no matter how hard I tried and how quiet I was, they knew exactly where I was all the time. I was probably oh, a good 200 meters away from the nest and I didn't get any closer than that. And, and still, yeah, excellent. Good to watch them though, it was kind of interesting. I'm sorry, uh, Nikon, yeah. I started out in the 70s with Nikon and just stick with it. Canyons of the Ancients, that's down in the Four Corners area. Uh, Sleeping Ute Mountain in the back there. This is one of the places where they extract, I think it is CO2, if you can imagine that. So we, you go in here and it's a very remote, again, BLM, not developed at all, but you'll see wells here and there for this and that. And those are off limits. You can't just walk up to them or anything. They've got work to do and uh, next slide. Yeah, drill down and pull it I'm not sure what, I'm sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. To push it out and pressurize it and move it up. Okay, makes sense. With a lot of the monuments are gonna look like this. This is an old, I'll say ruins, they're artifacts but they don't look like much. And especially if it's BLM or Forest Service, they don't have the funding to restore any of these. The Park Service is much more likely to be able to restore the property, the lands that they've got under their management. But one thing about, um, you go into these sites, they look like this and you pick up a pottery shard or something. First off, try not to do that. Second, <laughs> You can't remove it, that's illegal, that's a felony. Leave it where it lies because eventually somebody's gonna come in here and restore this. They're gonna research the history, archeologists or go paleontologists. And if you've removed it or if somebody's removed it from where it began, it's taken out of context and then they can't make sense out of what's going on at the site. One of the other ones we'll see uh, Agua Fria in, in Arizona, people decided to, put a pile of pottery shards on a stone there. And it's like, well, thanks a lot, but it, it defeats the point of having a, a ruin there that's protected. And so, yeah, okay. <laughs> Colorado Monument, you guys know where that's at over by Grand Junction. This kind of weather pattern happens after a heavy wet snowfall. The next day, dawn's clear, you got a warm sun, you get a lot of a lot of that snow melting and heating up and it rises up as a fog. Kind of cool. All right, first test, what's this? Okay, these guys were introduced in the, the Midwest and West here, to, I think back in the 1930s as a game species. And the places where they brought them in, they've, they've thrived. They, they just do, do great, they love it there. They love it at the monument. Did you say I'm sorry, ma'am. Say the name again. A chukar, C H U K A R, uh, or partridge. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody here climb? Two young guys. <laughs> so, on the left is Independence my Tower, and on the right, I went with a couple of friends, and we climbed. Otto's route. This is named for John Otto. Bit of an eccentric fella. Early 1900s, he decided to take it upon himself and go up to the top of this tower. This is in the 1900s, like 1910. Nobody's done this stuff. Nobody. So he gets a little axe out, and you can see here where he used to that axe and a hole and whatnot to chip out holes in the sandstone, and he did it up up through here as well at the cap rock on the top. And he made it to the top, which is just phenomenal because I was scared. <laughs> and you, I had all this modern climbing gear and ropes and safety belays and everything. 
and you get up to the top there and you're kind of hanging out and I was scared. And he did it by himself without any support and just, I don't know what compelled him, but so every year the climbing club in Grand Junction does an ascent in, in John Otto's honor on 4th of July, on Independence Tower, 4th of July. Yeah, kind of cool. So this is a great place. It's kind of a little gem. It's up there in the Northwestern corner of the state. You kind of have to want to go there to get there. It's not something you, well, I'll stop there on my way to, but it's well worth it. Uh, the Yampa and the Green Rivers flow through there. A lot of rafting, commercial rafting goes on. A lot of wildlife, a lot of birds and whatnot. Up on the north side, there's a dirt road, uh, McKay Springs, I think this is called. It's a small site of petroglyphs. The real draw is the quarry building, which is right there at the entrance near the visitor center in the Colorado side. 150 feet wall of rock that had been being excavated. And then they decided to build this building, construct this building around it and over it and protect it. It's some 1500 fossils embedded within the rock and it's 20 feet away. Yeah, great place for kids, very educational. It's just, yeah, millions of years, this stuff has, has been there. And they, somebody had the, the wise idea back in the 40s or 50s to do this, and they did it right. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you cringe every time you go over one. <laughs> Just north up in Wyoming, down in kind of the southwestern portion, the uh, Fossil Buttes, not a particularly large place. And the, the digs that they do there aren't open to the public. But the buttes themselves are quite beautiful. A lot of wildlife there, including moose. And if you take the road that goes up high, you get great views. And just beyond that, you go on to BLM land, which means you can have dispersed camping. So you can get up high and away from people and camp out there and kind of a cool place. It's just a bird. <laughs> Took me years to figure this guy out. <clears throat> A sphinx moth, correct? Cool. And this was found up there in southern Wyoming, just flitting around out there in what's essentially a, a sage desert. And I always think, well, you need water, you need something, some kind of food. And nope. I get five or six, uh, my, I zero escape my yard, and I get five or six of these guys every year in the backyard, just going from one flower to the next. It's just wonderful. And you might run across a what? A badger, the American badger. Yeah. Where do the wives? They can be very vicious. Wolverine is up here, badger's right below them. <laughs> very vicious. One of my favorite, favorite outings on a monument when I was doing this book with Jake, and it was just Jake and I the whole time, the upper Missouri River. <clears throat> Not terribly wide, but it goes the length of the upper Missouri, the, the breaks down on the, the eastern side. And we did this in late August. It was a little warm. It got up into the 90s. So most of our paddling was in the morning. We get up early and put everything in a boat, break down the tent. They have campsites along the way, an easy three, four hour float from site to site. Or you can do dispersed camping on the BLM land. Just make sure it's not private land because there's a lot that's mixed in there. But the river was like three, maybe four miles an hour. No rapids. We just kind of, I drank my coffee. I smoke cigars, smoke a cigar. The hardest thing you had to do was keep, keep the canoe pointed downstream because <laughs> it wanted to go around in a circle. Sometimes that was okay. And there's plenty of outfitters in Fort Benton so we didn't have anything, no boat, no cooler, none of that stuff. We rented everything from them. I think it was four or 500 bucks. They took us to the drop-in. 
and they picked us up five days later at the pullout. They took care of everything for us. And Jake, he's not a water dog. <laughs> not at all, he's a snow dog, but not a water dog. But to find him so relaxed there, and it just, yeah, it was just perfect. Next slide. A number of ospreys there, eagles, uh, white pelicans, a bunch of ducks, I, I can't recall half of them, some bald eagles, herons, just a wide variety of bird life. And then the, uh, the bighorn sheep, elk, antelope, you can see a lot of different wild, wildlife on this. And it's relaxing. I would encourage you, if you're gonna do it, um, pick up a book called Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose, Stephen Ambrose. It uh, chronicles the Lewis and Clark expedition. Even if you don't go up here, it's a great read. It really is. It, it, he writes it in such a style that you feel like you're right there reliving each step of the way. And it's, it's an incredible journey. Next one. These are the chalk cliffs in, in some of the areas at dawn. Oh, lots of opportunity for photography. <clears throat> Here's one that'll stump you. Anybody got a guess? Swan yes. A swan geese. That's an Asian species. <laughs> I put these in here because most of you are going to look at these bird pictures and say, I know that, I know that, I know, I don't know that. <laughs> so, so I put a couple in here to just stump you and throw you a curve. I appreciate you getting along with it. Yeah, that was in uh, Karkun River Valley in Eastern Mongolia. Um, <laughs> yeah, not a North American species. Beautiful bird, though. <laughs> so now popping over to the San Juan Islands. So you've got the Strait of Juan de Fuca coming out from the Pacific and then the Puget Sound, basically Victoria Island up here. Not a big monument, but dozens, hundreds maybe of islands within the protection of the monument itself, an archipelago, if you will. Most of them are only accessible by, by boat. And if you want to camp there, you have to use either a wind or human powered vessel to get there. You can't take your motorboat up there and crash into the shoreline and say, I'm here. No, so they protect them very, very well. What do we got here? Cormorants. The one on the left is a double crested, and I believe the one on the right is a pelagic. Not a what? Do they have that hook bill? Yeah, yeah. They, okay. Well, they were in a. It was at the uh, at the dock at Port Townsend, which is up on the Olympic Peninsula. And they were all in a group of probably a dozen individuals of both these two species. Would a branch find itself? The branch is a bit bigger than a pelagic. So uh -huh. that looks to be the same size. It's the same size. Double crested. So I, might, I may be wrong, but I think it's either branch or pelagic around the same. Yeah, the, the description I looked at for pelagic was they, they had a glossy appearance. And that's kind of all I went off of. I, I, I don't really, I know the one on the left's a double. Yeah, yeah, because of the yellow, but the other one was kind of a, a bit of a guess. So we'll just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to take a ferry to get out there. And this is the view on the ferry going over to San Juan Island. That's Mount Baker in the back. It's about just a little under 11,000 feet, heavily glaciated. It's worth it just for the ferry ride. And the thing with the ferry, you pay your initial fare, and then you can do what's called ferry hopping from island to island to island without paying any more. So your fare gets you out there and back and to all the islands that the ferry lands at. All you gotta do is get in line for the next one to show up. So it's kind of cool. Chance to see orcas. 
killer whales. There are several pods, resident pods, both within the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Fuca and uh, Puget Sound itself. So Anacortes, the jumping off point for the ferry on the mainland, has several gray whale and killer whale tour operators. So if you're going to go up there, you're going to be in that area, check on that. Are you guys familiar with the gray whale migration? So from the Bering Sea up in Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska, they go all the way down the West Coast, down to Baja, have their calves, and then the next spring go all the way back up again. It's a huge journey, tremendous. Anybody know what this is? Which one? <laughs> Mount St. Helens, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> Even I know that. So picture, picture this, I don't know if I can do this, going up to a, a cone about 1300 feet higher. And that's what was blown out that north side of Mount St. Helens in 1980. That much land mass it was incredible. They said the lateral blast, the winds, we're over 600 miles an hour. Yeah. And the mud, this is a Tuna River down here. The mud got so high, it blocked the drainage down into the Columbia River, which is a huge river in the West. And it dropped, I think, 11 or 12 feet. So big, big event, huge event. Anybody ever go to the top of it? You have? Yeah, yeah, on the, on the south side, you just slogged your way up all that volcano. There's a better way. Put your skis on, skin up and then yeah. ski down. <laughs> just do it a little earlier. Yeah, it's a slog getting up the south side. You need a permit. Uh, you get it in Cougar at the, the station there, but uh, not difficult. It's about 5,000 feet of elevation gain. So it, it's a bit of an effort, but uh, again, I would ski it or board it. I'll just go a little earlier. You don't have the crowds and it's much quicker getting back down. Beautiful peak though, a lot of interesting history here. This is the ape cave. That's on the south side of the monument itself. Well worth going to and visiting. Um, they have bats in these caves and there's what's called a white nose syndrome. It's a fungus and it affects the bats when they're hibernating. It gets into their nostrils and then into their brain and they come out of hibernation and then they're very disoriented and oftentimes it ends up killing them. So if you've been in another cave, don't bring anything that you had in that cave into another cave. You wash it, disinfect it. A lot of places will have a disinfecting station. You can scrub your boots in it and whatnot, but yeah, be extremely cautious of that because it'll, Really, it can decimate the, the bat population. They're very sensitive to that. So this thing's about a mile long. I, one year I actually went down to the end of it. There was a fellow back there beating on a drum and I thought, I gotta see this. I gotta see what's going on. <laughs> and I could see him at a distance, so I didn't bother him whatever he was doing. But at least two sources of light, extra batteries for both, maybe three sources of light, extra batteries. And not just your iPhone, you know, a headlamp, a flashlight. I took this picture and I did what's called light painting with my headlamp. You open the, the shutter so the sensor of the film is being exposed, and then you paint it with your headlamp, your subject. It took several tries to get it like I wanted it, <clears throat> but it eventually worked out. And as soon as the light's off, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was that dark. You wouldn't know if you were, even if you didn't have any light, do I go, where's behind me? What's up? What's in front of me? Yeah, you're totally disoriented. So, what a great experience. This is a lava tube. It's not a cave per se. Lava flowed through here at one time, all the way. That ceiling's probably a, a good 30 feet high, it's huge. Then it tapers down at the end. What do we got here? That's an owl, right? Which one? Great, great. I'm great, yeah, yeah. 
I had to get some help with that one because <laughs> I, I didn't have a clue. I, I so wanted it to be, uh, oh, what's that owl, owl in the Northwest? It's spotted, spotted owl, yeah. Was, well, yeah, I see spots, it's, it's gotta be a spotted owl. <laughs> I, I photographed a spotted owl, yeah. They call this Spanish moss that hangs off the trees up there because it's so, so moist. It's, it's a rainforest up in that area. This is right along the Oregon, Northern California border. I think there's five or six different ecosystems. It's a huge variety of plant and wildlife. You say, what? So what are these guys? Which one? Grebes, yes, but Clarks are Western. Now, Western, the Western and the black goes under the eye, the Clarks, it goes above. And that's as much as I know. <laughs> but yeah, enough to keep them separate because you'll often find them in, in similar habitat, doing similar things like this. Bears ears, huge monument, quite big, you can get lost in here. This is the uh, Monarch Ruins, pretty short hike, maybe a mile each way on moderate incline at the best. Um, the ruins themselves are off limit to the public. So many times in the past, these uh, archeological ruins were pillaged. People would take pottery, human bones, just anything and everything they could get and sell them on the market. And that's a lot of what drove the Antiquities Act in 1906 to establish that, to protect these sites from just that, that kind of thievery. So now everybody can appreciate it, but some of these structures, the architecture is just incredible. It just blows me away. They're, they're six, 7,000 years old. So, and it's still standing. It's just amazing. What's neat here is you can see the vegetation on the left and right down there is a pool of water a small pond. So they locate these, they've got shelter, some protection from the elements, a water source. They could probably haul that water out to arable lands, grow their crops, kind of had it all. Who's this guy? Because I don't, I honestly don't. Tyler told me and I've since forgotten. I was like, ah. The what? That rings a bell. I, I think I took like 40 or 50 pictures until I got one where he had his head turned right to get that catch light in his eye. All the others, it was just dark and it just didn't do it. But happily I got one and it turned out pretty decent. Natural bridges right in that same area. Actually, I think the natural bridges kind of sits inside the overall boundary for, for Bears Ears. Um, this is Onkohoma, Onkoyoma Bridge. They've got three or four in there. What's the difference between a bridge and an arch? Come on, children. <laughs> Students. So an arch often forms on a ridge line. And it's a result of uh, natural forces, free saw cycle, rain, et cetera, et cetera. Bridges often form with a water feature going underneath that cuts it out, but it's also impacted by the elements as well. But the distinction is arch on a ridge, a bridge over a water feature, a river or stream of some sort. This is huge, by the way. Grand Staircase, Escalante. Million acres. If you can't get lost here, you can't, you're just not trying. <laughs> There's a road, hole it goes down, I don't know, 50, 60 miles to a hole in a rock. This is the Devil's Kitchen area. A lot of hoodoos there, these sandstone formations. They weather differently at different rates because of the, the, the type of rock that they're made of than the surrounding land. And it creates all these kind of neat looking things. Um, that's a decent road down to there. It's about seven miles. You go a mile or two further, there's a couple of above ground slot canyons. It takes a little scrambling to get into and through them. 
and then there's an area where you can find dinosaur tracks. But if you want to go all the way to the hole in the, hole in the wall rock, an extra 50, 60 miles is horrible. <laughs> Unless you just have to go there, I would say, eh, probably not worth the effort or the, the wear and tear in your vehicle. Near, nearby uh, Kodachrome Basin State Park. So in the state of Utah, this is a state park, uh, camping, showers, laundry, and they got it all. They don't have a, I don't think they have a general store or anything, but nice place to camp out. A lot of these little towers in there within the campground itself. And there's uh, Grosvenor's Arch, which I think is 150, 170 feet high, short drive down the, war, down the road, and then a, a very short walk too. And it's, it's quite a large arch, pretty impressive. This is the uh, lower Calf Creek Falls. Again, a couple, three miles one way on a, you're following a stream bed, so it's almost level. And you'll have a, if you do this in a, in a warmer weather, you'll have a good 20 degree drop in temperature, just, just hanging out near the falls themselves. That reminds me, another thing, I wouldn't recommend going to most of these places in the middle of summer. They're pretty un, inhospitable. These are, for the most part, winter destinations, and they're great places to go in the winter. They'll give you decent temperatures, maybe a little chilly at night, but for the most part, 60s, 70s during the day, very comfortable, nice, clear, stable weather. So yeah. Lake Mead over in Gold Butte, Nevada. This was probably taken eight or so years ago, maybe a little more. And I can almost guarantee that water levels dropped significantly from this. Both Lake Mead and Lake Powell, they're down to where they can't. I, I think they're right on the cusp of not being able to generate power anymore. So they're, they're in a bad way. Beautiful sunrises and sunsets in the desert though. You get a little bit of dust in the air and that kind of gives you some color in the sky. Uh, it's kind of nice. We Westerners call this a newspaper rock. So some guy or gal came up here and said, that looks about right for me. I'm gonna scribble something here. I'm gonna create this feature. And they're found in a lot of different places. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, I can one up you. And they, they draw something and they put their foot on it and their hand on it. And they draw the animals they hunt and live with. And it's, it's a little bit of a history, a printed history, if you will. Anybody ever been over there to, uh, it's in the bear, outside the bear, bears here, San Juan Island. There's a panel of petroglyphs there outside of uh, Bluff, Utah. It's huge. I and mean, it goes for hundreds of feet. It's incredibly impressive. They got camping right there on the, right along the San Juan River. Worth going to this winter. Yeah, just amazing. And then up by Indian Creek, they have another newspaper rock, if you will. Just, Basin and Range, another huge monument. Another place to get lost. Nobody's gonna be there. Every time I've been, I maybe ran into one other vehicle. And that was it. It's like, you got 700,000 plus acres all to yourself. Just a beautiful setting. The Desert Tortoise, my friend Gary, let me use this photo. He's a professional photographer as well, but. Uh, very endangered. You see one, don't disturb it. Don't try to move it from one side of the road or whatever to the other. They'll get there. You can use your car to block traffic if you want, but don't actually pick them up or anything. Just let them do what they do. Next slide. Please. Anybody ever hear of city? This is what's called an earth art by Michael Heiser. He's probably a decade older than I am, so he's up in his 70s. He started this in the early 1970s. He's been at it for over 50 years. And he finally completed it, finally made it open to the public. This is a mile long and over a quarter mile in width. It's just amazing. I've not seen it. It's been closed to the public until just this year. At the end, there'll be an email address if you wanna get tickets 
they limit it to, I think, a half a dozen people a day. And unless you live in one of the adjoining counties, it'll cost you 150 bucks per person. But this, this is like a 30 or $40 million project that he's devoted essentially his adult life to. And I'm gonna go see it. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get there to see it. I'm sorry? Well, he uses earth and concrete to create various forms that represent ancient cultures like the Aztecs and whatnot. And kind of a modern day look at the Mayan civilization sort of, or his, his interpretation of that. And it's, it's intended to last for some time. So. so Las Vegas, you got Las Vegas down here. You go up 100, 150 miles or so in the basin and ranges up here. You know where Area 51 is? It's right next, it's right next door. <laughs> and they, they have this highway, what's it called? Is it called the Celestial Highway? Something to do with Area 51. Worth a drive, <laughs> just to check the box. But yeah, so it sits up there kind of um, central to the state of Nevada. Not much around there. There's a store, I think it's in Alamosa, south of that, uh, where you can pick up groceries and whatnot. But aside, aside from that, there's nothing. Most of these have no facilities, no water, no food, no cell reception. You're on your own. So whatever decisions you make, consider them very, very carefully. If any of these roads are wet, don't even bother. You can have the biggest, meanest looking four by four in the world you're gonna get stuck. And then you can start flipping out thousand dollar bills for the tow charge. Because that, that's what, well in Hovenweep, down in the Four Corners area, they've got a sign in the visitor center that says just that. Tow charges start at $1,000. They start there. So yeah, use, use very, very good judgment. Next slide. California Coastal, not very wide, not a lot of land acreage. It extends out into the ocean and it runs the entire western coast of California. But you, you can only access it in a few places via the land, which is probably a good thing. You don't have people crawling all over the place, but uh, this is one of them here. And I think they've opened this flight house up. They've re, refinished it, renovated it so that it's safe for people to go inside again. Point Reyes, I think maybe. Next slide. What do we got here? Ah, you all know that beautiful, beautiful song. Have you heard one? I used to do climbing all over the Pacific Northwest up in the Cascades. And we'd hear one of these things and it would just put you in a whole nother world, a totally different frame of mind. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous melody. It's a member of the thrush family, which a robin is a, a member of the thrush family. This is called a varied thrush. And they're generally found up there in Northern California, the Oregon coast. Yeah, just a wonderful bird. Yeah. Right up there with a the meadow lark. <laughs> so lots of opportunity for photographing the sunset on the ocean. This, there were actually waves moving along here. So it became, it was like a 30 second exposure. So those waves were kind of muted out in a, almost like a fog-like appearance. Wow. The winds coming off the Pacific Ocean, hitting these bluffs, perfect for hang gliding, launching yourself off one of the bluffs and seeing what happens. <laughs> the guy on the left, that's at Patrick's Point. It's a real popular, state park area that they do a lot of surfing at, very accessible for these guys and gals. I use a telephoto lens for that, like maybe a 400. And what that does, it compresses things. He had a lot of distance between the wave in front of him and behind him, but because of the effect of the lens, it makes it look like he's just threading a needle between the two of them. That's only half of it. Black. <laughs> yeah, the Americans are what we see like down in Texas and whatnot. The black ones are typically are gonna be found on the uh, Pacific coast. Squawky birds. 
So what's this? Carrizo Plains, kind of South Central California. Um, <clears throat> this is the Wallace Creek bed. You have the Trembler Mountains back here, the St. Andreas Fault running along here. And this is how that fault has moved 400 and some feet over the years. It, it, it's for me is the best example of what a fault actually does, what it, physically what, it, what happens when it's shifting and moving. So they say if you stand there for a million years, you, you'll eventually end up on, it's moving to the south, you'll end up at the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. It moves about as much as your fingernail grows in a year's time. Soda Lake here is a stopping area for uh, migrating sandhill cranes. They may or may not be there. And this is one of my, I love this picture. <laughs> it's great. Hobby Trails, another huge monument, 1.6 million acres. Outrageous. This is where the US Army trained in World War II to fight the African campaign and the campaign in Europe. Um, and over a million troops here at one, any given time training up to go fight World War II. Patton trained here, it's huge. They've got a camp there that's still preserved. Um, one of many that were located there during that time. This goes back to what's known as, are there, as the uh, Cadiz Dunes. Used to be you could access it from the north and it was only a, a five mile drive down a lousy road. Now you have to come up from the south and it's like 23 or 24 miles up a lousy road. And I had a truck, which is pretty capable, and it had a camper on the back, so it had plenty of weight and everything. But as you can see, it's like sugar sand. It just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's just me and Jake. And Jake, Jake doesn't have a thumb, so he can't work a phone. So he's no help, he can't hold a shovel. He'll just go lay off to the side and watch me. But we decided at this point, back over to the side onto a hard pack and we camped there the night and a short walk up to the dunes themselves. And well, just absolutely gorgeous, dude. untracked, untrammeled, no ATVs running up and down these things. And I had it all to myself. Yeah, just gorgeous. We stayed there a couple, three days for that very reason, because nobody else was there. Because of the sand movement? Mm -hmm. I didn't notice that, but I tried not to walk out onto the dunes. If you're going to go there to photograph them, try to stay along the edges because somebody may come back after you and want to photograph it. And sometimes the tracks are nice, but I'd say most of the time, probably not. That's not what I'm, I'd be looking for in an image of, of sand dunes at sunrise. Um, yeah, great place to go. If you take a vehicle to these places, one of the best things you can have are good tires and not, all season, more like all terrain kind of tires, sturdy with good side, strong sidewalls. They can take a beating. Um, obviously have a first aid kit, a shovel, maybe sand tracks. Um, forget your cell phone, it's not gonna work. So <laughs> don't rely on that. What you got between your ears, rely on that. Don't make that decision if there's any hesitation or concern about it. You know, it's much easier to walk to us to some place that it is to get yourself pulled out or towed out. Organ pipe. So that's the organ pipe cactus on the left. The one in the middle is a saguaro. And then the one on the right there, the teddy bear looking thing is a choya, choya cactus. The unfortunate thing about this monument in Ironwood, the only two places I ran into signs warning me about illegal people crossing the border because they both border the Mexican border and it's open. Anybody can cross there. Some of them 
just want something better. Some of them are up to no good. And their recommendation, if you see them, don't interact with them. Step away, move away from them, report them to the authorities. And it's kind of frustrating because I look at this as this is our public land and I should be able to go freely go anywhere within that without worry for my safety or health. I, I, I shouldn't feel threatened, particularly if I'm gonna camp out here. I, you know, camping out there overnight for several nights, it's like, it gives you pause. It, it truly does. And I, next slide. What do we got here? It's the Desert Cardinal. What's his name? Pyroluxia. Yeah. Look at those, that bill. Oh, you can probably crush your finger. <laughs> oh, that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Definitely busting up seeds. Oh, who's this guy? A verdon, a male verdon in breeding plumage. Verdon. V E R D U N, is it? I N, verdon. And again, it amazes me. I can go to these essentially desert areas and maybe there's some habitat that suits them, maybe a water feature. And the number in, if you can find there, it's just astounding. Yeah, it just blows me away. It's like, this is the desert. What are these guys doing here? It's like, well, they do what birds do. <laughs> again, beautiful, beautiful sunsets, sunrises. Best guess? Yeah, says feed. Thank you. <laughs> I know nothing about this bird, what, what its characteristics are, but again, another very elegant looking bird that you can find out in the desert of all places. Chiricahua, this is down in southeastern Arizona, right down there in the corner by Wilcox. Great place to visit. There's a lot of um, history there. Cochise's stronghold, the climbing area. Uh, around Wilcox, there's a, a wintering area for sandhill cranes. If you're looking to find the elegant trogon, this is the region that you want to go to. They have what are called sky islands, meaning these high peaks. You'll have a desert floor down here and then a totally different environment on these higher peaks. Maybe it's Ponderosa Pine for all I know, but it, it changes three, four, five times as it goes up in elevation. So that attracts a variety of different species as well. So a lot of good opportunities for birding. Those are called standing up rocks by the Apaches, by the way. So what do we got here? Hmm? No. Think of the J family, Mexican. <laughs> yeah, Mexican J. And I saw this at Chiricahua and I looked at that and I, kind of like you, I said, what the heck is that? Because I didn't, I'd never seen one before. And I thought, well, take a picture of it and figure it out later or have somebody else figure it out for you. And it turns out he's a Mexican J, so glad I did. What do we got here? In the same monument, actually this, this guy was right there in the campground with about 20 of his friends. Very aggressive, particularly around their young and they're extremely vicious. They'll rip you apart. Quatamunde, a white nose Quatamunde, Cotamunde, Quatamunde. Uh, raccoon family, yeah. They'll get anything you leave out including your cooler or any food source. Incredibly curious, the nose is very flexible. He'll stuff it down that hole in the tree to see if there's anything in there to eat. So, and your cooler looks as good as anything else and they'll, they'll get it open. Yeah. We know this guy. Again, an incredibly melodious song, descending. Canyon Wren, yeah. And again, 
I'm sitting at the campsite, smoking a cigar, just letting the morning present itself, kind of evolve, if you will. Morning coffee, Jake's laying down there by me, and this little guy shows up. One of the things they like to do is look, look in your wheel wells and, and up around your front grill and fender and pick up the bugs that you've hidden on the highway. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a buffet for them. <laughs> So I, I sat there and I probably took 50 shots of this guy just popping around, doing whatever they do and off my truck. And this is looking east towards the San Simeon Valley. Again, this is a pretty good sized monument, beautiful sun, sunrises, sunsets. And, uh, this is from what's called Maasai Point, which is the highest point in, in the monument itself. You can drive up there. Lots of trails. Almost all of these monuments have trails for hiking, horseback riding. Very few are designed for vehicles though. Ah. <laughs> what do you, ah, you don't count then. You can't count. So this, this guy is, I took this in Honduras. Now, the whole region, they're, they're probably widespread. This is a turquoise browed mot mot. I guess some kind of flycatcher, that tail gives that away, or I never noticed that. It was, I stayed at some lodge. I'd just gotten back from Colombia, and they sent me to Sotocano in Honduras, and I said, I need a couple of weeks off. So I rented a car. And I drove all around Honduras, <laughs> go to the ruins and go to these rainforest lodges they had up there. And it was just great, just a great experience. And I had, this was back in 03. You know, there were probably problems there, but I had no difficulty traveling alone as a Caucasian American. And just, yeah, great place to go, that region. And it's a, it's a place you can see. Uh, whale sharks up off the island of Rotan, which is separate from the northern coast of Honduras. Yeah, they have whale sharks up there, which that's on my tick list is to snorkel with a whale shark. They're just phenomenal to look at them. Okay, I'll go off on a tangent here. Agua fria, uh, cold water, that's what that stands for. Another old uh, set of ruins, again, don't move anything. We camped out nearby here because there was a water feature nearby. Okay. And I was so fortunate to come across an agave plant that was in bloom. And this was as if you stood out down in Times Square and said, I've got a million dollars in free money. I want to give it to everybody. The number of birds and um, bees and flies and everything that showed up to this plant. They only bloom once in their lifetime. This is a, a plant that's like 20 feet high, 20, 25 feet high. And birds, they came from everywhere, just a huge variety. I just brought my chair out about 50 feet away, sat down and got the right light and just waited to see who showed up. Montezuma's Castle, well, that's close to the public. Another good place for birds, it's right along a stream or a riparian zone. So. This is kind of interesting. This well, if it is, pumps out like 1.6 million gallons of water a day. 1.6 million gallons of water. So it's no wonder people settled there. It's like, what a great source of water. And even up here, the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you'll see two structures there, two habit homes. People lived right there on top of the water. They had ample water for irrigating their fields, good shelter, decent climate. The only problem is that the CO2 level in the water is something like 80 times higher than what's safe for human consumption. And that creates problems because CO2 will push oxygen off of your hemoglobin in the red blood cell, and it can make your, your pH, the acid base balance in your blood become very acidic, it can kill you, uh, asphyxiate you, if you will, because you can't get any oxygen. So 
no doubt they drank it and probably suffered some of the consequences, but their lifespan wasn't anywhere near what ours is today. Today, knowing that. My favorite monument, just because of the way it looks and the thought that went into building this structure on top of a hill, gives you 360 degrees worth of visibility for defense. You can see your enemy, you can prepare for him coming. The Verde River is just down into the valley behind the monument there. Lots of water, lots of arable land all around you. They're up above the insects, often with a breeze, quite comfortable, good place to live. You got it all. And, and they just, they did it in such a way that I think it's just really cool. <laughs> Next slide. Everybody knows this guy. Yeah, beautiful bird though. You can't help but catch your eye with it. There's a park, a state park, right by Tuzigut Monument. It's called, uh, Dead Horse Ranch State Park. And it runs alongside the, the Verde River. And at the right time of year during migrations, even in the winter, because a lot of birds will winter over there, tons of, tons of different birds in that area. Again, go up to the riverbank, find a, a likely spot that gives you a clear view, sit down and see who shows up. Somebody will come there, probably somebody you hadn't seen. Oh, <laughs> so what's this? Albert squirrel, yeah, absolutely. The little tufts of hair distinguish him from the other squirrel species. They tend to favor a, a higher altitude, ponderosa pine kind of environment though. Yeah, vermilion flycatcher. This is one of about a hundred shots before I got one that was even semi-sharp. And even then, to be honest, the, the flyer bug in front of him, I actually moved that from another part of the picture just to make, well, to be honest with you and to make it a little more interesting. He was going for that fly, but he would have been right up there at the top of the picture. So, yeah, this is, uh, oh gosh, east of Phoenix, Apache Reservoir, huge reservoir. They got like 500 campsites there. That escapes me the name of the monument. Mm -hmm. Somebody got a book out there they can look at? <laughs> well, what I keep blathering on. Ah. It's a small monument. They got an upper and a lower ruins. The lower ones are open to the public. The upper ones open to the public, but you got to go with a guided tour from the park service. So. Yeah, it's in Arizona. Wouldn't be important because that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about Tuzigut, but uh, but now I now that I brought it up. Tonto. Tonto National Monument. Next slide, please. <laughs> Canyon de Shea. This is kind of up in northeastern Arizona, a little out of the way. It, it's um, not hidden or anything. It's just a little bit out of the way. If you're going to Page to do anything in the Page area or along what they call the Arizona Strip in northern Arizona, it's a worthwhile stopover. The Navajo run a campground there and it's you're, you're, you're nestled in a pretty large grove of cottonwoods. You get a lot of birds coming through there. They do tours down into the canyon itself. Very interesting history. Lots of different birds come through there and they hang out in those cottonwoods. What's that? Bullocks. Bullocks oil. Next slide. And this guy? So it's a bluebird, right? Western mountain. Western. Yeah, Western bluebird. I used to get those confused because surely the all blue one must be a, a Western bluebird, but no, they look, a, the Western bluebird looks a lot like the Eastern bluebird. 
there's a lot of similarities between the two. Rainbow Bridge, so the situation here has changed. Accessing the bridge, uh, used to be you could get on a tour boat, hour and a half later, they'd park you at a dock, you'd hop over onto the trail, walk down a few hundred meters, there you were at the base of the, the arch, or the bridge rather, I'm sorry. Now, with the lowering levels in Lake Powell, and they've had some severe rains out there and the damage from that, the Park Service has removed the dock so you can run your little boat up there for a ways, but then like they say, proceeding any further is at your own risk. <laughs> and, and they're not gonna come get you because you're quite a ways from anyone. So if you wanna visit that, it's uh, do your homework, you know, research it carefully and decide if that's worth the, worth the trouble or not. The alternative is to get permission from the Navajo Nation and do a multi-day backpack cross country up and down all these canyons with limited water availability and end up here at Rainbow Bridge. And then you get to repeat that and go back out. So, <laughs> so you better have good navigation skills and be able to find water or pack a lot of water with you. Who's this guy? The Roadrunner. You know, I've only seen them fly a couple of times and it's only to get up into a tree. So. They're almost a flightless bird. Next slide. Anybody know what this guy is? So if I recall, something about an antelope squirrel, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. We get a consensus here, we'll go with that. <laughs> Next slide. So this, this is the wave. You can see my backpack and tripod, and you can see how very small that area really is. You can't have 50 people out there every day. You really have to limit the numbers. You can do an online lottery, or you can just show up in Kanab at the, I think it's a Forest Service office or BLM office, put your name on a list, come back the next morning. If they pick your name off the list like they did for me, good to go. Next day you go in there. It's about three miles looking in that direction from the parking area to this. It's, it's not real well signed, but it's adequate if you've got a sense of navigation. And I'd bring a compass, certainly. Maybe a GPS. If I don't know how to use those. I know how to use a compass. And I can mark waypoints. And Jake and I stayed there through the evening after sunset because I wanted to get some, some night photos of the the formations and then the stars, and they didn't turn out so good. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, did you see any uh, cell phone or photos there? Where did I see those? Not here, but at Whitmore Overlook in the uh, Gold Butte. This um, Vermilion Cliffs area is a release site for the California condors that they're trying to reintroduce into that area. The one I saw in at the Whitmore Overlook, which overlooks the western side of the Grand Canyon, most of the birds in the Vermilion Cliffs are going to have no, white numbers on their wings, so they can be tracked and easily accounted for. This guy was flying below me. I was totally unprepared for it. I had a wide angle lens. And I wasn't looking to shoot wildlife. No markings whatsoever. So he had been born, like most likely born in the wild, never captured, never tagged and was continuing to live in the wild, completely wild bird. And I thought, ah, and he was just like right there, <laughs> just soaring around, doing his thing. Cedar Breaks, it's kind of like a mini Bryce Canyon. Yeah, similar formations, lots of bird life, a lot of flowers, but this is at a pretty high elevation, I mean, eight, 9,000 feet. So don't, don't go there in May expecting a spring bloom. Look at June, early to mid-June. Call the park service that, that's up there and say, well, what are the flowers doing before you go there? This is a plateau fence lizard, I believe. So I got down on my knees to eat, try to get an eye level view with him eating his, his or her lunch. <laughs> Oh, that's where it is. Whitmore Canyon is 
Mooibo Overlook is in the Grand Canyon Parish on Thompson. Huge place. We drove in there, I don't know, 30, 40 miles to get where we are. And we're still seven miles away from the Grand Canyon down the road. But there's a lot of volcanic debris here. And it was just going to puncture a tire. I don't care how tough it was. There's a ranch there, the Bar 10 Ranch. They cater to a higher end of clientele for rafting and whatnot. And he told me they rent out their ATVs to their clients. And he, he goes out there every day to fix flats on them. Every day. He says the road's so bad, the rocks are pointed, they just rip up your tires. So we camped here and we're happy for that. Very secluded, isolated. Nobody's home except me and my dog. <laughs> and at the Whitmore Overlook, it's a camping area. That's run by the Park Service. The other one's run by the, it's all within Grand Canyon Parishon, but the Park Service has carved out a little piece of it that they manage. And you have to go by their rules to get through that piece and to camp at the campground. So you need to go to St. George, Utah, go to the interagency office, get your camping permit, and then drive 30, 40 miles down there to the overlook. If you're gonna do that, I would say do it at least for two days. Yeah, at least two days, because it's a lot of effort to get down there. And the last part of the road <clears throat> is, you kind of need a proper four wheel drive to get up. It's real rocky, rutted, and it's pretty steep. I didn't have any trouble in my truck, but you know, that's a good truck with proper four wheel, four low, you just kind of go low and slow. The good thing is, is they've got a parking area a quarter mile away. You can park there, Pack your stuff up to the campground, camp there if you want for a few days, go down to the Overlook, look down in the Grand Canyon like this, down the Colorado River. And then when you're done, just hike back over to your, to your vehicle. Beast getting stuck that far from anywhere, busting an axle. <clears throat> what do we got? Somebody help me, scrub or pinion? Scrub day, yeah. Again, out there in the middle of the desert. A weep is part of this monument. Several hundred feet on this embankment of uh, petroglyphs. It's a little difficult to access. So what I would recommend if you wanted to go down there, bring a pair of binoculars because the trail runs right here and you can easily see all these binoculars or all these petroglyphs with binoculars without having to go up there. And don't touch petroglyphs. Your fingers have an acidic oil on them that will damage them over time. So. This is at the outhouse at the, the campsite. <laughs> it just goes to show you that the Park Service does indeed have a sense of humor. <laughs> If you wanna do a screenshot, this is the email. If you're interested in going to see city up in Basin and Range Monument in Nevada. Again, very limited access, not inexpensive, but I anticipate it being an incredibly unique experience. Is this in your book? Yeah. Oh, the, the link is not because it wasn't open before. No, they just opened it this year. They won't be, be taking the 2nd of January. So you shoot them an email, give them your dates, how many people are in your party, give them some alternate dates so they can work with that and take it from there. You can go to Las Vegas, party for a while, eat at all those big buffets, and then go out to the wilderness and just contrast the two, <laughs> how absurd one is and how natural the other is. And I think one more slide, if everybody's good with this. And <laughs> so that's skiing down Torrey's Peak after we summited Jake and I. Yeah, and he loved it. As he got older, I, I'd make a few turns and then I have to wait for him to catch up, give him a cookie, and then I'd make a few more turns. But he just, he did a 180 in this person. He came to life on snow. 
that was in his DNA. It was his element. He just had a blast. And we'd be, when we ascended this, it was about 4,500 feet going up and you'd have to kick snow, steps in the snow. And it, previously he'd gotten smart and he just followed in my steps. So usually I take a big step and I'd have to accommodate his reach and make them smaller so that he could get into each of the steps and, and follow us. The cool thing that he did as we were climbing this, it just blew me away. He's so polite, he had to pee. So he gets out of the track, he walks over off to the slope, maybe 20 feet away, pees, comes back over, gets back in the track and we keep going. And it's like, <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought? What did I, yeah, he's, he's yeah incomparable just a fine fellow so, so this is it thank you guys i know get out of here <laughs> so much we appreciate you oh, being thank here you. so thank you appreciate mike it. does have copies of his book available to me at this time of price as well so um you're welcome to get one from him and have him yeah autograph it for you and just want to say thank you one more time Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, everybody. You can hit the lights. And appreciate you all coming out. I apologize. It ran a little longer than I thought. But I know, and I cut it back, and I practiced. I looked through it, and it still didn't work out. And, you know, every time the interaction with the audience is a little different, that, that dynamic changes. But I hope you enjoyed it. Mostly, I hope it motivates you to get out to these places and say, hey, there really is a lot to look at out there, a lot to do. $20. So, I'll sell you one. So, Mike presents at each one at different times. Which one do you go back to now? Um, Thanks, everyone online. Pretty much any of them in Arizona, because bird life is just phenomenal there. Uh, the upper Missouri River. I do that again. Thanks, Tyler. San Juan's because of the the marine life, the bird life is just a beautiful setting. And I, I try not to go to California, but these monuments and the national parks there are just phenomenal. So. Yeah, that one. yeah. Should I write something on these? One, two, is one for you? 